and have time for the KGB hacking section. Do you want to have that on the record? Potentially not. Um, so now we've done sort of the image to features. We've again done it very simply. There could have been much better ways to do it. But we have a starting point. And so now we sort of get on to the, the next task. So we just covered the features. You know, what are the things we can extract from the raw data? What are the useful intermediate representations that we can use? And now it's sort of the making predictions step. And so this is where we have to think. We got into it a little bit before about how is this model or whatever we're trying to build actually going to be used. And so, you know, we have it on a phone and you take a picture. And so really the only piece of information it's able to get is the picture. And if you take a picture, you probably want a response in three seconds. So you probably can't spend 20 minutes processing the picture, going through each tiny little section, seeing if maybe this has this allergen in it, or maybe this part looks like a pine nut. So you actually are quite limited in what you're able to do because you don't have sort of a un, you know, boundless resources. Or you know, we could also, you know, you don't have the ability to select foreground and background. So you just have the image, the raw pixels. And so any analysis you need to do, you need to fit into Take the raw pixels and spit out some kind of prediction. Um, then, this is by far one of the most important parts to think about, um, is this idea of sort of the offline evaluation. And so this is when you're dealing with any sort of machine learning problem, something you should be focusing on, where you look at uh, what are the sort of methods that I'm going to use to evaluate the data, and what metrics am I going to focus on? And so here, um, there's a bunch of sort of medium articles uh, from Cassie Korsukov, so the head of decision intelligence at Google. And she does a very, very good job of simplifying complicated tasks and concepts into little mini YouTube videos and articles. And so ideally, you want to understand the statistics behind it as well as possible, but this helps you a lot with sort of the intuition of what you're trying to do. And this is, again, very closely linked to sort of the scientific method with how you come up with hypotheses and how you test these hypotheses, but with data science it becomes a lot more difficult to see exactly where all of those pieces fit together. Um, so this article is quite useful to read. And kind of the core idea is that you have sort of all of your data. You have the part that you're going to show your model to train it, and the part that you're not going to show your model at all. And really what you're trying to avoid is you're trying to avoid, you know, looking at clouds and seeing bunnies. <laughs> that like you can look at this image and say, yeah, it looks like there's a bunny there, but it's only because you just have this image and you're able to kind of identify patterns where there probably isn't any. You know, there's probably not any causal mechanism that made a bunny appear in the clouds. It's just random chance. And if you were to look at thousands of clouds, you would see thousands of different patterns. Some of them looked like animals that wasn't. And so the core idea for this is that people and machines are very good at finding patterns but they're not necessarily good at knowing which patterns are noise and which patterns are really useful as signal. And so that's why you have these ideas of sort of splitting your data up. And if you go to the article, um, you have this idea where you have sort of your main chunks of data and you split it out into different groups to make sure that any patterns you find are patterns that fit in well with what you're trying to do. <clears throat> so um, there's a bunch of videos on here that sort of explain, you know, one of the more funny <laughs> articles. <laughs> so if you do, you know, extrapolation on, you know, yesterday you had zero husbands, today you have one husband <laughs> by 20 years from now, you'll have thousands and thousands of husbands. And so, you know, clearly, for us, it's obvious that that's a ridiculous extrapolation, but for a computer model, that's a very reasonable way to connect to these two points of data. 
Um, and so really what you want to see is that, you know, when you build a model, is it able to generalize correctly to new situations? And so we know the humans are quite easily able to go to new places and perform the same tasks that they did before. You know, if you've never cleaned a room before, you can probably figure out how to clean a new room based on other rooms that you've cleaned. Um, for models, this becomes much more difficult because finding the right patterns and identifying the right setups is very tricky. And so, um, yeah, I think this. The right mix of the Yes. <laughs> so that you see lots of things like this. Um, also, um, there was a cleaning robot, so that was basically optimized to make sure that it, um, you know, didn't see any dirt. And so every time it saw dirt, it had to clean. And basically, what the robot learned to do is go in the corner. And then it can't see anything, and then it doesn't see any dirt, and then it's done. <laughs> so it doesn't mean you've cleaned anything at all. And children, obviously, are very good at this as well. But it's sort of these local minima, as they're called, where it's actually solving a problem in a very inappropriate way to be solving that problem. And so there's lots of entertaining examples for this, which you can go through and sort of read. And basically, the idea is that when you split your data up, if you're able to divide it into groups reasonably, and there's a phenomenon that's present in all of your data. If you find it here, it should show up there as well. And so this will help you confirm that the things that you found in your sort of exploratory part are still valid. And so this kind of separation becomes very, very important, that you have chunks of your data. So if you collect 10,000 images, you can't use all of those images to build a model. You use some of those images to build a model and some of those images to make sure that your model's actually learning something that's useful so that when you put it to the real world, it's actually working. And in science, this sometimes gets a little bit lost because people get very interested in publishing papers and having really nice results and less interested with how it actually works in the real world. And so you have lots of groups that sort of have models that have really, really high performance but actually don't work well in the real world because they just wanted to have the best result on some competition. And so having sort of the discipline to think about, I want this to work beyond just the data set, and my problem isn't to get the highest accuracy here, it's to make something that actually works. Um, I think she picks on neuroscience quite a bit, but there's certainly plenty of fields that do this. <laughs> and so the idea for this is, um, that we have you know, different ways of splitting up our data. We split our data right now up into sort of a training and validation group where we try to balance um, the size of the groups with how many different classes we have. So this becomes a quite difficult problem of how many groups or how many samples do you need to have in your group? And what do you think the biggest problem we're going to have is? when we split our data up, if we were to just take 20%. Do you think that's enough? Or why do you think that could be an issue? We already have a skewness in how we divide data or label the data. Yeah. yeah. So if we only have 30 examples that have eggs in them, then there's a chance that we don't actually have any eggs in our validation set, which means we don't know if the model's able to predict eggs accurately at all. So if the model never says eggs, we say it did really well, because there's no eggs it has to predict in that set. And so when you have really skewed things, this becomes much more problematic. Um, we then look at sort of how do we evaluate a model? And what do you think the problem with accuracy would be? So accuracy is the simplest one. If I say it has cow's milk in it, how likely is it that it actually has cow's milk in it? You know, how likely are those two to merge? <laughs> and what do you think that an issue with that might be? You know, that we do our first version of the model and shellfish has 97% accuracy, fish has 99% accuracy. Is that really good? Well, 
that's a whole different thing. Like, what are the consequences of being wrong and being, you know, of a true positive and a false negative? So that's one of the big things, yeah? That, you, that comes in usually afterwards. What about just the 99% accuracy? Does that seem really good? Yeah. I mean, I can make a 99% accurate cancer screening right now by just saying everyone doesn't have cancer. And that's 99% accurate. Think about one thing I would do, so if it's a sort of deep base left, right? So micro organisms contained in the food, right? Mm -hmm. So when you have 99% of safety, and you're killing microorganisms, you can say that far above the threshold. Yeah. So that yeah, fundamentally 99% doesn't mean that much. It depends on what how the balance of your groups are and what you're looking at. Problem. So for the fish, 99% basically just meant it said no fish all the time. And you had so few examples of fish that it never actually learned anything about it. It just learned I should always say no. And that's 99% accurate, but that's a very useless model. You don't need to put that in an app and put it on the phone. You could just say, no, there's probably not fish in this thing you took a picture of. Because in our training data, there were very few fish. And so that's really where this becomes a problem. And that's why we have sort of these ideas of using sort of this ROC curve, where you focus not just on how accurate you are, but how many true positives did you have, how many false positives, how many false negatives, and how many true negatives. And that you see here, as you sort of move your decision line, and so basically this is where you say, anything above this is true, anything below this is false, that you have this whole range you can move it along, and you have this ROC curve that we get. And so this is where then, by having this curve, you can match it well to the application you're dealing with. So if someone's deadly allergic to fish, then you'd want sort of the number of false positives to be high, but the number of false negatives to be incredibly low. And so by doing that, you're able to kind of push the problem out and say, we have a model, and you pick as a user where you want that line to be. How sensitive do you want it to be? Do you want it to really have no false negatives? Or are false positives something that's quite annoying? You know, in hospitals, this becomes quite a problem because, you know, if you do mammography screening, for example, on all of the population, and you have lots of false positives, then you have to now do biopsies in lots of people, and biopsies have risk, and so maybe you have a chance of finding a tumor, but if you're doing lots and lots of biopsies, and some people are dying as a consequence of them, then your test overall is actually hurting people, not helping them. And so having these curves and having the ability to sort of shift this decision is quite important. And so that's where, when we go to sort of the models that we train, um, the bottom is the uh, false positive rate, and the x-axis is the true positive rate. I'm not sure where the x is that. And so here are the curves that we get, and we see that even though fish is 99% accurate, the ROC curve, or the predictive power our model has, is incredibly poor because it just always says no. And so what we want is we want a model that's all the way up there, or as close up there as possible, because that means it has sort of the most predictive power and is able to differentiate between these groups. And so here we can <coughs> click to go to building sort of the first model, where we take sort of the features that we had before. Oh. Um. And we read them all in. So here we do sort of the first reading steps. Then one of the useful things to look at is sort of the correlation between these different groups. And so this kind of shows us, you know, if you have one, how likely is it that you have another one as well? And so here we see that, you know, if you have wheat, there's a 25% chance you also have cow's milk. 
so that those two categories kind of move together so that their predictions probably aren't completely independent. And if you have cow's milk, there's a 23% less chance you have soy, which also sort of makes sense that if you were to have a lot of soy in your product, you probably wouldn't want to ruin your vegetarian status by then adding cow milk or vegan status. And so you can kind of see how all of these different groups work together, which can be helpful when you're trying to make these predictions to see which ones are in fact really independent from one another and which ones are strongly connected. <coughs> and so here we then split the groups up. And so what we say is, first of all, the test size should be 20%, so 20% of our data we use to validate it later, and we stratify based on what allergens we have present in the data already, so that we want to make sure all the allergens get represented in the validation set as well as the training set. So then we create sort of these feature vectors from it, and so we take all of the different images that we've done this feature analysis for, and we now combine them. So we have a training for the X and the Y, and a validation for the X and the Y. So the, the X are sort of these um, uh, histogram features that we're putting in, and the Y are the different allergies that we're trying to predict coming out. And so that we see we have 255 features and 7,000 images, and eight things that we're trying to predict as the output. And so here is just a bunch of code to kind of show the results so that we get all of the plots and things that we want to have. And then the first model that we use, well, so there's an even simpler model we use called scikit-learn dummy, which basically just guesses the average every time. And that's sort of the most simple baseline that you should be very easily able to beat. The next model we can use is called sort of nearest neighbor, or K's nearest neighbor. And so what that does, does anyone have an idea how that works? Yeah? You plot the real distance to the... Yeah. So it basically just takes the new image you put in and says, from the feature vector I have, what's the closest thing I have already seen to what I'm putting in now? And so it's a very simple approach which doesn't try to learn anything, it just tries to say kind of what's the closest match to what I had before. And it's also a very nice baseline one to use because it shows us a lot of the issues that we run into immediately. So we train our model up here. It's actually easier to show on this one. So we train our model here, and then we show the result. <laughs> and so we can see sort of the first group. We see the, the area under the curve for the ROC curve and the accuracy are 100%. And that for each one of the images we put in, we get exactly the right result. Do you think we're done? Is this a good result? Should we just stop and go to lunch now? <laughs> what do you think might be the problem? We can have the same picture all from different sources. Yeah. So what we have here is basically it's just matching the picture it found in the training to the same picture again. And so it's getting perfect results because it's just spitting out what it was trained on before. And so it's not actually learned anything at all. It has perfect, perfect results because we didn't do a good job of separating the training and the validation group. And so when we show the results of our models, we never show the result on training because you'd expect any reasonably complicated model to be able to get 100% on training. And so we always have to leave that completely out because it's not relevant at all. And so if we dig down deeper, what we see from these images, you know, this is the image that goes in. This is the matched 
the feature it's trying to match against. <coughs> this is the closest match, which has a distance of zero, which means it's exactly the same image. And it's, of course, going to get the right result. We can then scroll down, and we see here is where it sort of has the first separation, where we have imitation crab salad and bruschetta with tomatoes. And so we see, even though those features are very close together, by looking at them, they're very, very similar. There's clearly very, very different ingredients in those two meals. And so, yeah, the color signature we have is quite bad. And basically what this shows is that when you have tomatoes, it matches any image that has a red background, <laughs> which isn't particularly useful, but it's at least sort of a starting point for working on this. We then have this image down here where you have a Neiman Marcus cake and peach bread. And so there, it's matching images that are fairly similar, but probably have similar ingredients as well. So there it did a reasonable job. And so what we have to do is we have to validate our model on sort of the validation split. So on the data it's never seen before. And what we see here is that now the model performance is much, much worse. So we still get 97% accuracy on fish, which doesn't really mean very much because fish is very, very rare. Our main thing is the AUC, and the AUC is 0.5 for almost everything, which means our model has almost no predictable power. So it gets high accuracy because it learns sort of the averages, but it doesn't actually do anything useful with the information, and it gives lots of long, wrong results. So yeah, you see for bread pudding, it gets that completely wrong for cherry cobbler. And another thing, what concerns you about these predictions? Or if you were making an app, would you want to have predictions that look like this? Yeah? And sometimes it's just missing my text. I would say, is this in or not? Yeah. And so having something in between would be much more useful to a user because you could say there's a 20% chance this is in. So if you're deadly allergic, definitely don't touch it. But if you're only a little bit allergic, you can maybe risk eating it. And so ha having decisions where you give more information as an output is much more useful than just giving zero or one. And so having just this k-nearest neighbors where you just use one, you're only going to ever get zero or one as outputs. And so you're kind of missing out on the ability to communicate more to the user and make it a lot easier to kind of interact with a tool like that. And so you have to kind of start thinking about how people are going to use your tool and what sort of information they're getting out of it from an early stage, because you need to pick models and match up your problem well to what they're trying to do. And just for this plot, in case it wasn't clear, so each one of these points is a prediction. And the... Blue points are points that were negative, so that don't actually have fish in them. And the red points are the points that actually have fish in them. And so you can see from like this prediction, there's a lot of no fish products here, and there's a lot of no fish products there. So it hasn't learned anything at all. Maybe for the wheat, it's learned a little bit more, but also there, it's not particularly useful. For peanuts, it's actually learned the opposite. So the only positive peanut case is classified as negative. And for cow's milk, yeah, I mean, most of them have done quite poorly. But it just lets us see how that model works. So the next kind of simplest model we can use is linear regression, where we just sort of feed all of the data in and try to fit a line for each one of these different features that you could have. And so here we see we've already getting much more interesting results. And so for the AUC curve, or the area under the curve, if it's 0.5, it's basically random guessing. If it's below 0.5, it's worse than random guessing. And if it's above 0.5, then it's doing much better. And so we can see actually for our fish case, it's 0.47. <laughs> so it's worse than random guessing. And what it actually means is that when it tells you there's fish in it, you should actually inverse that and you get a better prediction from the model, <laughs> which ideally is something you don't have happen, 
But if you have a really, really, really poorly performing model, inversing it can make it somewhat better. <laughs> but that you have, you know, things like peanuts, which it does a fairly reasonable job, you know, 0.63 is, you know, quite a bit above 0.5. So it is learning some features that are relevant for that feature. And so here we see the overall predictions. And so the predicted values we can see kind of overshot what we actually had, so it predicted eggs and cow's milk a lot more frequently than they happened, and wheat a lot less frequently than it happened. And so that kind of helps us see, you know, does the model have a bias? Can we just take it and sort of down-tune it or up-tune it to get better results out of it? <coughs> and, you know, we can see that it learned for a lot of these images sort of averages, where, you know, kiwi pineapple smoothie, cow's milk, eggs, wheat. So a lot of these things from the model wouldn't necessarily be very useful. So if you're trying to build this, this wouldn't help you very much. For this one, it does a little bit better. Dang good chili, it kind of predicts the same thing it predicted up there, maybe slightly less wheat. And here, for whatever reason, that graph looks quite funny, but that you can see tendentially the red points are higher than the blue points, so it's still not perfect. But you know, you want the majority of red points to be here, and the majority of blue points to be there. And so the better separated those are, the easier it is, or the better your model works. So we can then start some more kind of pre-processing where you try to scale the inputs, normalize it, remove colors that have very little variance. So basically, if you always have you know, no black in your image, then you shouldn't use that as a feature. So these are kind of standard tools in a package called Scikit-Learn. And that what you can get out of this <laughs> is sort of slightly better models. And so we see here that it's a little bit better tuned. Fish isn't quite as bad as it was before. That we only have one that's sort of below 0.5. And that all of them are still not great, but we've gotten rid of sort of the very worst models that are responding to just <coughs> But clearly, with linear regression, we wouldn't really expect our model to work brilliantly. And so here we have a much nicer plot of that, where we can kind of see, you know, where are the positive cases and where are the negative cases, and how usable is it. And so this gives you a much better feeling of like where the actual images are or cases are, and how your model worked. And so you know, with fish, the prediction was always very low, and you have one fish that's classified at the bottom, one in the middle, one at the top. So your prediction isn't really informative at all. But for wheat, you can see that it starts to get much more wheat-like as you get up. But if you wanted to be really certain that you got all the wheat cases, you'd have to have a threshold of like here. So it probably wouldn't be very helpful for people who are trying to avoid eating. You can then sort of get to more complicated models where you start using sort of PCA, so you only use a few components, <coughs> and then build sort of decision trees on top of that. And so here we get to models that none of them are below 0.5, but all of them sort of perform slightly differently, and we can now see that, you know, on banana stuff, <laughs> I guess there's more letters to that name, or, but it predicted cow's milk fairly high. <laughs> and we also see that this is a mislabeled data set, right? I mean, maybe that's made from the banana, but if I were to label that manually, I would say that looks like cream. And so the fact it predicted cow's milk very high isn't really a massive mistake, because that was a realistic thing to predict from that image. And it's probably just our label that's not good. So it's always important to be looking at images and random images because you probably can't ever look at all of them. And so just by randomly sampling them, hopefully you get through enough of them that you start to appreciate which labels are really useful and which ones are really bad. Egg roll extravaganza. <laughs> Bacon lay sweet potatoes. And so, so there's all kinds of very, very weird recipes in this data set. On here we see we have sort of more of these sort of individual um, like strided lines that come through. 
And that actually comes from the fact that we're using a decision tree. So decision tree is potentially one of the most useful models to have because it's very easy to understand and it's something that you could potentially explain to someone else. So if we go here and look at what the model actually learned, is this not, okay, I guess that's not gonna happen. Yeah. Can I not zoom in? I guess we'll have to. <clears throat> so basically, the idea of a decision tree is, I mean, you don't have to worry about how it actually works or how it's trained. What's important is that when you're done, you basically get a set of hierarchical rules that you apply to the data that comes in. And so for our data, we have sort of all of those different color channels coming in. And what it says is, you know, if the third color channel is less than 0.8, then go into this group. If it's greater than 0.8, then go into this group. Now, if the third one's less than 1.75, go this way, otherwise go this way. And so you can have this sort of simple set of rules to follow where it makes a decision about what category something falls in based on a bunch of true and false rules. And so all of them are based on individual components or individual colors and sort of yes, no decisions. And so it's a very nice model because it's quite interpretable. You can quite easily see what would happen if this image had slightly more yellow how would the output change? If you can just change the output to so a yellow and kind of see where is that decision boundary being made. And so this is one of the more kind of important tasks in machine learning is understanding kind of what would it take to turn this from a, from a positive wheat case to a negative wheat case. And so if it were slightly darker, would that change the output? If it were, um, you know, had a slightly larger foreground and slightly smaller background, and that you have these sort of simple rules that you can try to follow, and we have those here as well. But unfortunately, they're quite difficult to see. Where'd it go? It's down here. So you should be able to potentially save that image or see it somewhere else. But that that's sort of the model that we're looking at. And so with this data that we have, would you expect a decision tree to be able to work very well? Yeah. But with a decision tree like this, I mean, it only has four levels. Do you think you could make a decision tree like that that would be able to classify wheat based on just one color. So basically, it's kind of a hopelessly like underpowered model to try to solve this problem. That by looking at you know, how much green you have, is it above this value? How much red do you have? Is it below this value? How much of this shade of blue do you have? Is it above this value? You know, with this depth and that challenging of a problem, Yeah. Well, no, so what's nice with this, though, is that because it's a regression tree, the output isn't necessarily just a category. It says, so for some of these decisions, it's if you go into this bucket, if you go left here, then add 0.3 to the wheat prediction. And if you go this way, then subtract 0.3 from the wheat prediction. So you get a little bit of a spectrum, but as you see from the output, you do get a very, like, um, discrete set of predictions for each one so that you're not getting the full possible range of values you're sort of getting a bunch of different values that you combine together but that it's fundamentally you know not a problem you could solve yourself so if you couldn't write down a list of rules having a model like a decision tree which is very <coughs> is nice but 
probably won't ever be able to solve your problem because you couldn't yourself write down a list of decision tree rules to classify images into different allergen categories. And so you always kind of have to balance those two ideas of do you want a model that's really easy for you to understand, but is then by definition going to be quite stupid, like it can't really make complicated decisions because it just has, you know, you're able to view everything that's going on, or do you want a model that's going to perform really well but where you have a much more difficult time trying to figure out what exactly it is doing. And if you would assume that the color is a, a real, let's say, a good information yeah. that you can derive it from, and you would make your decision tree, let's say, in, in small steps, yeah. and change it further, uh, you might certainly come to a better end. But yeah. uh, right. always assuming that the color is the dominant. So right now we, yeah, as you just said, like the sort of, we have color, which comes from an image, which is really unreliable. That, you know, if you have a red light bulb in the room, everything in your image will look redder. It doesn't mean your carrots are actually redder. And so what advantage we have with a lot of this as sort of scientists is that if you're taking a spectra, you know, 690 nanometers is always 690 nanometers. It doesn't really matter how you're illuminating it if that's what your spectrograph measures. <laughs> that's about what you're getting out. And so those rules can make a lot more sense for physical quantitative measurements than they do for something like images. Because sort of the features we have with these images, you know, it's only, you know, is this brown mean that it's well done? And it's a well, we only see that because it's darker than that brown. Or that you identify bacon because there's sort of different stripes of darkness and brightness but that there's not an absolute value that bacon always has to be. You know, there's a range of things that can be, and so it makes it very difficult to come up with simple decisions you apply to. But there's a lot more data for these kinds of problems, and so you can take sloppier approaches and solve it by just having tons and tons of data. And so here we can go to fancier models. This is where we go to random forest, which instead of just having A uh, one tree makes hundreds of trees. So I think we say here we make 200 different trees. So we break the data up into little pieces and come up with a lot of different trees and then sort of combine all the answers together. And so this gives us the ability to have a much more complicated model. And we see the performance goes up quite a bit for it, but it's still not perfect. But it at least sort of, you know, Surely Temple Ice Cream Host is able to get the cow's milk quite reasonably. It says wheat as well, which is probably not a great guess. For the eggs, it doesn't do particularly well on that. But I'm not actually sure. I guess it has eggs in it. It's the top one for pins. Yeah. Well, no, I wasn't sure if the mozzarella cheese was sort of looking like an egg or if it is actually... <laughs> <That's an egg. laughs> With the bubble banging, I think it's like that. Probably. Okay. I just didn't see where the mozzarella was, so maybe it is. Maybe it's just pesto and. Well, again, there's lots of potential issues with this. Yeah. Just a question. Just before you would go to like a random forest, wouldn't it be better to just take one of those pictures with egg? We have one hundred something pictures. No. With egg labeled. Could just take like this picture, cut it in four pieces, and it also should always detect egg in there. So you would increase with already labeled pictures the number of egg classifies it. Right. So that's one of the things we won't get into at all for this, but that's sort of called data augmentation, where you try to take your images and you say, like, actually, if you flip this horizontally, it's still an egg image. And if you make it a little bit brighter, it's still an egg image. If you make it a bit darker, it's still an egg image. Um, and so, yeah, so you can, I mean, in what exact order you do data augmentation and switch to more complicated models is really up to you. But clearly, there's a huge range of cropping, zooming, rotating that you can apply to all of these images in order to make them sort of more diverse. Because obviously the more diverse or more sample images you have, the better your model is going to be able to identify more complicated patterns. Because that's actually what we do in the very, very last step, 
when we try to get a really good working model. But we see for this, it's already doing much better than it was doing before. You know, it still struggles with some of these rarer classes, but it's generally getting fairly positive results. And so basically what we're trying to show for this is you know, what's possible as sort of the dumbest combination, right? We're still dealing with very simple features where you wouldn't necessarily expect it to work very well. You know, I couldn't take that histogram and tell you what's in it. And so having, expecting a model to be able to magically do this is quite a bit to ask. And so we're just trying to figure out kind of what the baseline is. Um, so XGBoost is then a more complicated model <coughs> where you can then get even more complicated results. We won't really go into that, but you, know, you have lots and lots of potential with trees and sort of standard fitting kits before you do kind of anything else. And so you can tweak those models, you can change what input goes into them, you can change how you generate the points. But this was sort of the idea with the, the decision trees, is that you're able to have sort of this then decision um, surface or a decision sort of plot, where you can see, you know, this gets counted as wheat, and this gets counted as fish, and this gets counted as um, you know, milk, and where are the boundaries between them, and how does changing individual components change the likely prediction that comes out. Because making things like this can make it a lot easier to understand sort of how your model's incorporating the different information that's in. And then there's a bunch more details on sort of these kinds of models and how they work in sort of my lectures. I have a reference to it from there. Um, and then we have, are we on? So we're already on building models. So what we change here now, so we've made our kind of first set of models, we've come up with some baseline predictions, and now we want to get to sort of the more complicated, exciting part. And so before, we sort of just had the color and images. That was the easiest thing that we could try to quantify. And now what we have is sort of how can we incorporate shapes and patterns in images? into what we're doing. And the answer to this is we can reuse patterns learned from other models. So rather than trying to come up with, you know, what is a carrot, what's a, um, an egg, what patterns make an egg unique, we can actually take an existing model that's been trained to solve a similar problem and adapt it to what we're trying to solve here. And so this is what is done all the time machine learning. And this is sort of called transfer learning. And so we have a notebook there that's not super useful. So there's a very famous competition called ImageNet, where there's 14 million images, and I think a thousand different categories. And so they're images that are collected on Flickr and a bunch of other websites. And there's thousands of different examples for each possible category you could have. So I think if you go to explore, uh, you can look at all the different categories that they have, but they have, you know, I don't know what most of these things are. <laughs> There's no examples of it, so it's yeah. not particularly useful. <laughs> hmm. Maybe there's a better. So this is a very simple version of that data set where you just have 10 categories. So this is called something called CIFAR 10, where you have little tiny pictures of automobiles, birds, cats, deer, dogs, frog, horse, ship, truck, where the challenge is to take images and automatically classify them into one of those groups. And so what's quite useful about this is that when you train a classifier to solve the problem, 
But this one, it's able to learn that, you know, sort of the difference between a horse and a dog is like the fur pattern. And so it learns different fur patterns that it includes in the output. The difference between, you know, a ship and a truck is probably some of the shape, and that a ship is usually on water and a truck is usually on land. And so it learns, you know, some of the colors and the patterns in water, and then the patterns that you see on land. And so what you're able to do is sort of leverage the fact that there have been lots and lots of models trained before that have lots and lots of features in them that you can use as an input for this problem so that it starts off knowing a lot about texture and shapes and patterns that you can include in your prediction. So that rather than just taking simple color information, you can actually take a pre-trained model that understands the world. And sort of when you think about how humans make decisions, that you know you spend the first few years of your life you know, just looking around, seeing different patterns and shapes, and then you're able to leverage those patterns as you move forward, so that you recognize that, you know, a bubbly surface from magma looks very similar to a bubbly surface from, you know, a boiling mud pot or something like that, and you're able to make connections between those different patterns that you've seen before, and you can do the same thing with sort of machine learning models. And so here, there must be a better... Yeah, so here's some examples, I think, of the, the different categories that you have. And that what's quite nice about the ImageNet one is that there are thousands and thousands of different categories present. And so you have things like Dalmatian, Egyptian cat, snow leopard, starfish, mushrooms, cherries, fungus, jellyfish, all kinds of different things. And that then means it has a lot of patterns in it that it already understands very well. And so that, you know, in order to tell the difference between a squirrel monkey and a spider monkey, you know, it has to be able to see stripes on the tail. In order to see the difference between, you know, a, a current and a cherry, it has to see the shininess of the surface and sort of the size compared to the leaves. And so it's already learned a lot of these very useful things. And what you can do is then just take this model that already knows this, remove the part that's focused on squirrel monkeys and spider monkeys, and attach a part to train on just the task that you're looking at. And so rather than using these simple just color features as the input, you use the output of a pre-trained model and then try to figure out how that maps to the problem you're trying to solve. And so you leverage the fact that this was trained on millions of images and apply it to your much smaller problem with just thousands of images. And so that's a fairly hand-wavy explanation for how this works. If you take a deep learning course, they'll certainly give you a much more rigorous version of that. But in this allergen classification, which is sort of the last notebook we have, we do exactly that. So we take the same inputs that we had before and you can click edit or edit a copy. And so for this one, you need internet and GPU turned on. And so you might have to verify your text message or SMS address in order to have both of those turned on, because apparently people have used Kaggle to mine bitcoins before. And so they <laughs> want to make sure they know who's using each one of these curves. And so that you can go here, and the same way we did the linear regression or other simple models, we're able to apply a deep learning model. So you don't really have to understand how it works, what exactly it's doing. You can just apply the model or as a feature generator for what we're working on. So we have the same things. We split up the groups. We try to balance the groups out a little bit more. And then here we have sort of all of the model parameters. And so here are defaults that I sort of picked or guessed. But you can change all of these to change what the model actually does. And so here we use a model called Inception V3. But you could also use ResNet or DenseNet or Exception or VGG. There's tons of different models that you can try, and all of them have different sort of benefits and shortcomings. So some of them are very good 
If you're trying to run it quickly on mobile, other are much more accurate. So if you really want high precision results, then you would switch to one of them. But we'll use Inception as sort of the basic one. You don't really have to worry about what it looks like. You just pick what image size you want it to take in, you know, how many dense layers you want to have, how many samples in each group, learning rate, and some other basic parameters like that. And so here is where we actually load the model up. And now is sort of the augmentation part, um, as Lucas had mentioned before, where we say we don't want to just use each image once. We want to kind of add little small deviations to all the images. So here we have you know, all of these different things that we can do. So um, feature-wise center and sample-wise center, we can sort of normalize the images. So if the images were coming in with very, very different intensities of brightness, you might want to turn that on. Rotation range is you know, how much you rotate the image each time. Width, shift range, height, shift range, shear range, so how much you move the top versus the bottom. Zoom, brightness, horizontal flips, reflection, all sorts of other steps that we can apply. And so basically, by tweaking this, you can make your data set much, much, much bigger in order to train a more complicated model to solve your problem. And, you know, there's... So for this, it has to fit in your RAM? Or can you, is it augmented, save it somewhere, and then access it when it needs it? Or? Right, so this, it augments it in real time. So you create all the augmented images for a batch or a mini batch. So that was the number we specified up here. Yeah, so 64. So it makes 64 synthetic images, puts them in, and then it makes another 64 synthetic images and puts them in. And so you can actually do that all on the GPU and have it run faster. But the easiest way is to just have a bunch of different things running on the machine to generate these little batches. Uh, but fundamentally, uh, it's usually fastest to augment in real time, because making 10 copies of your data and saving it somewhere is then quite tedious to load everything up again. And so this is just a nice tool for doing that kind of while you train. And then we have sort of this little helper function and then we make sort of our training data and our testing data. And so we can then show what exactly we've kind of collected once those are calculated. A second or two. Well, I guess maybe it's being pretty slow today. Oh, there it is. And so that we can see all of these images get sort of rotated and shifted and changed slightly so that they're kind of <coughs> representing the diversity of images you would see in kind of a normal situation. And so it's not perfect. You know, obviously, if you do things that you would never expect to see in the real world, you would probably have a worse performing model. So if you make it zoom in too much, then you probably won't see the object anymore. If it's zoomed out, then you won't have enough pixels for it. But tweaking those parameters, you can kind of see where a good balance is between getting images that are still easily recognizable and having enough training data so that you can actually train a complicated model. And so there isn't a magic rule for how you pick these things. You kind of have to tweak around with different numbers and see how they perform. And so here, we then show the labels, and this is also quite helpful. And so this is for that same 64 batch of images. How much do each of our eight different allergens, how frequently do they come up? And that we've made an effort to balance out the groups much better, so that you still see things like eggs come up fairly frequently, even though it wasn't in that many of the recipes. And so if you see here that there's entire regions that are black all the time, then that means there's no way for your model to even kind of learn what an egg would look like or what an egg feature would be. And so here it's quite helpful to see what exactly is going in and if it makes sense. Here I don't plot the numbers with it, but if you go back up, you see the, the labels that should 
So it's cow's milk, eggs, tree nuts, peanuts, shellfish, wheat, soy, fish. And so even though we don't have very many examples of fish, we, we use them quite frequently so that you have a number of examples that have fish in them. So this is then, you take advantage of thousands of hours of training and research by just using this pre-trained model. So it's just downloaded from, I think Google for this one. And then you say you don't want to train it any further. You say you want to keep it exactly as it is, recognizing the patterns that it does, and just use it to generate all your features. So here you see yeah, it's downloading the model. And that here, we're able to show the model that we have, that we have some sort of image going in. We have this model coming out. We have a few other layers that sort of turn it into a prediction at the end. And that we have, you know, 22 million total parameters we can fit, but 21 million of them are not trainable. So 21 million we're just taking from this model that already exists and copying them directly. And so we're not trying to improve them, we're only trying to kind of fit 500,000, which is still a very large number of parameters, but hopefully small enough that we can get a reasonable result. And so here, we can then actually train our model, and you can see, so an epoch is sort of one pass through all of the data, and a batch <coughs> is sort of each one of these little ticks that comes across. So you should see it. Yeah. And so each one of these batches is 64 images that's being loaded, and by putting workers equals three, we get three separate sort of processes that are generating the images for us, and so that this goes much quicker because you're able to kind of produce lots and lots of images at the same time. And then we have sort of our mean absolute error and the binary accuracy. And so we start off already at 67%, which is quite high, but it's sort of what you'd expect given that so many of the categories are off all the time. And so the model actually hasn't learned anything yet. It's just learning the averages, and then it will slowly move on to learn the other components. And so if we, you can wait for that training to finish, but I think it takes a reasonable amount of time, even though it's running on a fairly fast machine. You can see Yeah, it takes two hours. <laughs> so probably not a good idea to wait for the whole thing. But you can run it for shorter amounts yourself and sort of see how it does on intermediate results. And that here we have, yeah. This sort of result where we see the loss, which we won't worry about right now, and then the binary accuracy. And so is there something concerning about this plot of binary accuracy? With the training being the red and the validation being the blue? Then that's better to have some correction. Yeah. And why is that bad? Because it means that it performs better on the training for So you want it to perform well in data that it's never seen before. You want it to generalize. And so when it starts to perform much better on training data than on validation data, it basically means it's kind of memorized your training data and it isn't actually learning to solve your problem anymore. And so even we train, even though we trained this model for quite a long time, sort of after the third or fourth pass, it stopped learning new things and started just memorizing the training data. And so this is one of the constant problems you have with these models is that they are very good at memorizing things and it's much trickier to get them to actually learn 
the important features and the right signal in all of the data. Because so much of it is so messy, it's quite difficult for everyone. Okay. And so sort of learning when that point happens and how you can make sure you don't train too far beyond that is quite important because you don't want to have models that work really, really well in one specific scenario and then don't work at all when you try them on something else. But like from the the models or pre-trained models you have don't you will never see such a plot. So how do you know those pre-trained models work well? Well, you can see those plots for those pre-trained models. Okay. Um, so usually in the, the papers that publish them, but you're not actually concerned. So with the pre-trained model, it was trying to solve a task of like, what's the difference between a squirrel monkey and a spider monkey? And you don't actually care if it was able to do that really well. Like, you were cared, is it able to figure out the patterns in the image and to do a reasonably good job? And what you're concerned about is when you then apply these features to your problem, are you learning the right combinations of them, or are you just learning to memorize the inputs? And so yeah, if you have a really, really overtrained starting point, you'll probably get a much worse performance when you try to apply transfer learning to a new problem, but you still are more cons much more concerned with the curve on your problem than the curve on the original problem. But when you say you can just take models, And see whether they do a good job and not, yep. not identifying whether it is somehow related to a feature which is intrinsic to your to your kind of problem to resolve your yep. this, you know, allergic potential of your allergic uh, bacterial potential. Right. So just say let's try each model later, whether it finds any type of pattern which is not right. describing it. And so that's, yeah, so, so, so all of these models are sensitive to slightly different patterns. And you probably don't always know which patterns it's going to be, which patterns are going to be the most helpful ones. And so by trying the different ones, you see which ones map well. But would it make sense to try identifying whether there could be some pattern, whatever, yeah. pattern, whatever, uh, which, which is related to the, to the structure of the pyramid of the and so forth? Right, so that's where it gets really exciting. Or I think it gets exciting. Maybe you don't. <laughs> um, so I think this one's it. The differentiable image parameterization. And so basically what this is, is this is trying to figure out what features models are responding to. And so this is taking pre-trained models. This is done by a team at sort of Google Brain and Google AI where they try to figure out exactly what's going on inside of these models. And so the initial version of this was called Deep Dream, where you have um, I mean, there's plenty of very, very creepy images you can see. But that you can basically take an image, and you can say, what would it take to make this image be classified as a dog? How would I change the image? So that it would get classified as a dog and apply some other transformations to it. And so it then learns to make Mona Lisa look more and more like a dog to the model. And as you see with this, it, it does lots of other very weird things as well. But you kind of get a feeling for what your model's view of the world is. Because the eyes that neural networks have are very different than our eyes. And they're sensitive to very different things. But you can start to see what patterns are quite important for making certain decisions. And some of these images, I mean, artistically are quite entertaining to go through. Um, yeah, where you get creepy, yeah. So if you try to make a dog out of food, you can see that sort of it's, it clearly understands that a dog has a nose, two eyes, or several eyes, and sort of a spot. Some of the more Fun things that come out of this are also called So where it generates the so I guess this may be I hope for, this is a safe for work website. <laughs> but that this is then where you actually have it generate completely new images that it thinks look realistic. And so here you get 
all kinds of, <laughs> you know, that it, it knows that a clock has lots of lines on it, but it doesn't really understand how all of these lines are connected together. Similarly with, yeah, here's and there's, I mean, there's tons of Twitter threads that have more of these, but you see quite a few images that are then incredibly real, so that with this example, these images never existed before, so it's actually able to generate these images from nothing, but that some of them you can then start to appreciate what sort of things the model was sensitive to. So like it learns that frogs have lots of eyes in weird places, it learns that spiders have lots of legs, but it struggles to learn that spiders have eight legs, which you would see is a much more complicated concept because you'd somehow have to be able to count all of the legs together. So is there a reason why we don't see any color shifts or repetitive kind of, you know, in the images before, there, there, like, there's this spectral kind of color yeah. that goes through the image and rep repetitive uh, some uh, patterns. Yeah. And in these images, this is gone and it, it is photorealistic, right? Right. What's, what's the reason behind yeah, that? So the models get more and more complicated. And so with this one, they actually have models that are sort of competing against each other. Mm -hmm. So one model makes an image, and another model tries to determine if it's fake or not. Yeah. Yeah. So that's sort of what GAN is, in a very like simplified version of it. And so you are able, so the model is able to learn that if you have these weird color shifts, that's an easy thing to detect. But if you have a spider with 12 legs, that's a lot harder to detect. So it struggles with those larger concepts a lot more. But you end up getting all kinds of very interesting, weird images, which kind of help you see how these models think or see the world. And so the deep dream ones were like the very early stage models. And these are some of the more modern models that have come out. Um, and then this sort of differentiable image parameterizations are quite useful because what you try to do is you try to figure out sort of what, what is each layer inside your model really, really sensitive to. And so there you can take a model that you've never seen before and go through it and try to figure out how many of these layers overlap with things that might be useful for the problem that I'm solving. And so you can see with ImageNet, there's a lot of layers that are very focused on eyes because there's a lot of eyes in the training data. And so if you're doing food, probably you don't need lots of eye detectors. So models that had too many of those would be things, maybe you'd want to specifically turn them off or exclude them, but that they would probably not be very helpful. But that there's other parameters. I thought there was. So you can see other things of what the model is sort of, maybe this isn't it? Of what things the models are sensitive to. And you know, for that one, potentially that feature could be a lot more useful for food products or striped patterns or different color stripes in your images that you want your setup to be sensitive to. And so your cars probably would be less useful, but some of these other ones could be more meaningful Yeah, and here you see some of the simpler patterns that come up. I think there's, maybe there's a better. Oh, feature visualization, sorry, this is the better one. So here you can go through the models and see sort of what each one of the different layers is learning to be sensitive to. So that like the first layers, textures and patterns are probably very useful for any food problem, but once you get to sort of this part, they become a lot less useful. And so even where you decide to sort of cut your model and retrain it or learn new features from it would be very different. You know, most of these, I guess some of these features might be useful, but a lot of them would be a lot less useful. But probably most of the patterns, textures, and edges would be very relevant for any food-related problem that you try to solve. So they have been examples here where you can take in models, load them up, and go through what each different layer of them is doing and trying to get an idea of what things it's the most sensitive to and which might be the best starting points for it. <coughs>
<coughs> and that, yeah. You can also then get much further in that when you try to sort of attribute which parts of your images were really important for making a certain classification. Um, so I think the somewhere here. So there's other data sets that are made available. So one of the groups at ETH does uh, made a data set, I think, of 110,000 different food items in 101 different categories. So this is then a much better starting point for food problems than ImageNet. Where is it? So it's called Food 101. So here you'd have, you know, not the labels of the actual ingredients in them, but you'd have images of cheese plates, fish and chips, apple pie, and the goal is to take an image and classify that into a category. And so if you took a, pro a model that was pre-trained for doing that task, you would, that would be a much better starting point than taking a model that was pre-trained for doing classifications of dogs and monkeys and everything else because you'd have a lot more specific features for what you're trying to solve in your image. And so here we can go to kernels. I think food CGG attention is then one of the, the more new concepts that people are applying to these kinds of problems. So rather than just trying to learn what category an image falls into, you try to learn which region was responsible for that decision. So that when you have you know, a prime rib, this was the most representative region for deciding that that was prime rib. And so you can kind of see what the model was paying the most attention to when it tried to make a decision. So this is sort of explicitly where you try to have that sort of foreground background separation by telling it it shouldn't look at the whole image, it should just focus on parts of it and to tell you what parts of it it's focusing on. And the vignettes, you see sort of the border of it and where the powder is. It's one of the more useful regions. This, the french fry, just on that. There's other examples. Lasagna, ramen, I guess it focuses. I'm not sure exactly what it looks like, <laughs> but that you can start to look at these things and decide how they work. Yeah. Do you use this also to check if it makes sense what it is yeah. deciding? Like if it looks something totally random, or is it the background? Or something? Right. Then you would decide your model is probably very bad. So this gives you like an easy way of sort of checking is your model generally focusing on the right things or is it focusing on the wrong things? And sort of having that additional input beyond just it took all these features and spit out this result but it actually was focusing a lot on you know here focusing a lot here I wouldn't be confident that it would make the right decision by looking at that part of the image yeah but there's a hundred categories so 12 percent is already kind of high one percent would be sort of the lowest but it, but even like the lasagna one, I mean, you can see the colors in that image. I would have a lot of trouble saying that that was lasagna. But it also did not do very well in that. Could it, could it be like programmed to like tell like, oh, this is in like incandescent lighting versus natural lighting? Like if you take the little color map of the image and then scale it based off of whether you can deal with indoor or outdoor lighting? That's what people have been trying, like Photoshop, Lightroom and all of those tools have been trying to do that for a really, really, really long time. But it's, as far as I know, a quite unsolved problem. I mean, I guess everyone saw the, the gold and blue or white and black dress, right? <laughs> <laughs> Which, I mean, for people who didn't see it, gold and white. probably just the dress would have found it. The dress. <laughs> 
but where there were quite significant arguments about what colors you actually saw? Is there? Oh, it's, it's the dress on Wikipedia as well. Yeah, yeah, the dress. <laughs> and potentially you can't really look at it in a projector. But the idea was that sort of if you don't know what lighting it's in, your brain will sort of assume one lighting condition versus the other. And if you assume the wrong lighting condition, then you correct for it the wrong way. And so it's quite difficult to automatically guess what the lighting condition is. I thought um, the computers were smart, smarter than us in that way. They could figure out the lighting condition. Mm -hmm. okay. I mean, I, the last time I used Photoshop, it was quite terrible. But it could delete <laughs> people from images quite well. <laughs> but it couldn't figure out what the right temperature for the light was 80% okay. of the time. So sometimes it works much better. I think if you have external sensors, if you're able to look at spectra in more detail, you can get more information. But the problem is, is that you, know, you could have images that looked like that under a number of different lighting conditions. And it's hard to know if this is blue because the light's blue or because the dress is blue. And correcting for that becomes quite tricky. But they are. Uh, Making models less sensitive to that or correcting for that in advance would make these things work better. Or, I mean, the easier thing to probably do is when you're augmenting data to augment a number of different light conditions. So you change the white balance a number of different times so that it's not too sensitive to exactly what the white balance is. And it's what's nice about having like ImageNet with 14 million images is that you have a huge variation of lighting conditions covered in that. But probably not everything. I mean, clearly, all your dogs, you know, your winter wolves are taken outside, and your chihuahuas are taken inside, and so it probably learns lighting conditions do are important for some types of classification. So yeah, so that's I think the end to the slides. More or less there. So yeah, there's. Sort of, if you're interested, um, a course should be held next spring. Um, and then on Kaggle and data sets, here were the, the food-related competitions that you could compete in. So Yelp restaurant photo classification, grocery sales forecasting, what's cooking, um, I think where you took images and tried to predict what category they came into, um, inventory demand, market basket analysis from Instacart. So there's a number of little problems you can start working on there. And what's quite interesting with this is you get sort of immediate feedback, because there's competition, there's a rank, a ranking, and you can kind of <coughs> see if your idea helps you go up the ranking or not. And you can see a lot of other people's submissions and sort of get new ideas from them. And so it's a quite useful platform for seeing what other problems people have tried to solve. And they have all kinds of other data sets that are publicly so if you're dealing with you know, Raman spectroscopy, I think there's a few dozen Raman data sets there. Probably aren't exactly what you need, but you could look at what analysis they did, or you augment your data with some of the data that they have and try to do something more with it. Um, then there's sort of the more intense challenges, which are like the biomedical brand challenges for biomedical imaging, which are probably less relevant for you, but they're much, much bigger, larger scale competitions. And a lot of them deal with like microscopy x-ray images and trying to find different diseases or um, do some people to give access to you combine with non-image information for the same type of products? Yeah, so a lot of them have quite a bit of non-image information. Um, I think the grand challenge one, if I'm not mistaken, all challenges. So they have tons of challenges on there. <laughs> And so they have some of them which are only images that you get as input, and some of them where you get images and, you know, other sorts of features, you know, gender that the person has, uh, age, and trying to make predictions combining all of that information together. But there should also be the freedom to, to implement some spectral data. For spectral ones, I assume there must be some. I mean, they have MRI, but that's images again. They must. 
I guess most of these don't have, I guess don't have any spectra data in mm -hmm. there. Histopathology. So clearly most of the work has been done with images and sort of text modality. Do we have infrared reflectance, OCT? I guess none of those really look like. Maybe OCT has some of it. I mean, I think if you go, so Google also has a data set search. Mm -hmm which is quite nice because it searches a number of different archives. And so you can go there. And so there's over a hundred results found. So you probably want to be slightly more specific on that, but they have lots and lots of different data sets that have analyzed various samples. That you can look at as sort of a starting point. Because what Kaggle is also very useful for is if you have an idea, you can test how well your idea works on another data set before you spend a bunch of time collecting data and labeling data yourself. So that if you think something might help from Spectre, you can try to find some similar enough problem and see how much progress you can make on it before you spend a ton of time collecting and doing experiments yourself where it might not work anyways. And particularly in the competitions, you have sort of feedback. I mean, you see what other people are able to do, and if your model is actually better on a new task than theirs is. And so I think that's where it's also quite helpful at sort of grounding your analysis because you're actually competing with other people rather than just trying different models yourself. And you have someone else who's split up the data for you and only gives you a piece of it to train your model, and the part where you test it, you never end up seeing. Potentially, you can find some ex vivo data sets that are similar enough, or at least that would let you figure out what might be possible. Um, and then again, you can take these data sets and simulate some of the artifacts that you might get in line. Right? If you're doing them in line, you probably need to have more metal reflectance or something like that. So you can take the data and make it worse and see how much worse the performance gets when you add the artifacts you'd expect to see. And so what's nice with this is that you don't have to collect any data yourself because once you've kind of collected data, it's you know too late to optimize your experimental design or you know figure out what intensity you wanted to use or all of these other aspects that are quite critical. And so if you can take someone else's data, figure out those problems, and then hopefully save yourself a few experimental iterations, then you can move on. Yeah. I have more uh, general question <laughs> about the um, data Google acquires or, or shares. So yeah. We now looked at, at dog pictures and human pictures. Yeah. And what are with humans? So can can you also create artificial human faces? Yeah. From deep dream, and if you can create artificial human faces, you can also scan human faces and then basically. Google could identify all of us with the picture. So more like how, how are they handling the sensitive data? Yeah. Oh, how they handle the sensitive yeah. data? Um, I guess I'm less aware of. So one of the things they have, so these two people never, so this is from NVIDIA, never existed. So they're from a random number generator connected to one of these like deep dream paths. So this is potentially one of the things that could make it a lot easier to deal with sensitive data, is that if you can generate millions and millions of fake people to test all of your algorithms on, then you don't need to keep data from real people. Of course, to make the fake people as realistic as possible, you need to collect tons and tons and tons of data first. <laughs> but you would use some data. Potentially. <laughs> 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 
Well, it's trained on a celebrity yeah. database. Yeah, so. So it's very <laughs> skewed towards what celebrities look like rather than what normal people look like. And how celebrities' images are taken. That, you know, the lighting is good. Um, obviously, like, the racial diversity of this data set is much narrower than you'd see in the real world. Most of the data sets that exist, you know, aren't created in Africa. You know, they're created in the US, China. Um, some European countries, but the mass, you know, most people aren't represented particularly well in these sets. In terms of like protecting identity, I mean, I think most of the companies are quite concerned with that, but how well they actually do at keeping all of these data sets stored is debatable. And when you're trying to build the best models, you don't necessarily want to cripple yourself by not giving yourself access to yeah. lots of data. But the you know, regenerating human faces, it seems to work quite well. But there are, um, I think Kaggle also had a number of competitions on this with um, like model fairness is a very, very big aspect. Just you could basically generate millions of, of um, virtual identities with this generator. Yeah. And then, I don't know, just, <laughs> <laughs> just maybe, you know, like you, there's a lot of potential, good potential in it, but I mean, maybe you just have some comments on what's the easiest stuff you can also do with that. I don't know. Yeah. So like, are there, are there some public cases where people are masterminded, I don't know, um, making virtual identities and then creating bank accounts? Ah, and... uh -huh. I actually don't know. I I mean, you'd still need like a birth certificate or, yeah. I mean, just having a face is usually not the only <laughs> requirement that you have. But I guess if you were able to make fake passports and things, that you'd have the potential of doing that. Um, uh, but there certainly have been quite a few, I think, I don't know if it was Tinder, but I think it was a site like this, that in order to sort of get their user community growing as quickly as possible, had lots of bots on there, so that you're always talking to people. Because if you go on the app and there's no one there, it's quite boring. And so if you're able to generate fake people with fake personalities that say simple conversations, then <laughs> you can make your site a lot more interesting for people at the beginning. And if you don't have any ethical qualms about putting bots on dating sites, then yeah, it's a quite easy company with a professor with a professor so that Yeah. Yeah. Somebody, they actually used an actor and they had a, a video 